I'm Dr. Judith Beck, president of the Beck Institute for Cognitive Behavior Therapy in Philadelphia in the United States. We are a training organization. We do national and international training in CBT. I'm also a clinical professor of psychology in the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Pennsylvania. I'd like to talk about the importance of the therapeutic relationship in cognitive behavior therapy. Unfortunately, there are many clinicians who believe that the therapeutic relationship is not all that important in cognitive behavior therapy, but that is untrue. The therapeutic relationship must be strong. So it's essential to have a good relationship. It's just not sufficient. We need more than that, but we need to start with a good relationship. I think one of the reasons that some people think the therapeutic relationship is not important in cognitive behavior therapy is because they have learned to do CBT through the use of treatment manuals. Now, treatment manuals are very important to conduct randomized controlled trials, but in actuality, in practice, we don't use treatment manuals. We develop an individual conceptualization of the client. We work to establish a very strong relationship. And then we use the principles in treatment manuals when we're treating an individual client. So a good relationship, a good therapeutic relationship in CBT means that the patient and the therapist both have a high degree of respect for one another. The relationship is very collaborative. So the therapist doesn't make decisions just on her own. She proposes, for example, uh, different interventions and makes sure that the patient is in agreement with it. The therapist always shares her conceptualization of the patient and makes sure that she's gotten it right. So it's a highly collaborative, respectful relationship. Sometimes there are ruptures in the therapeutic relationship. Now, this especially happens when patients come to therapy with very negative, extreme, dysfunctional beliefs about themselves and other people. If they believe that other people will be critical, will hurt them in some way, then they will naturally assume that the therapist might do so also. It's very important that we not only conceptualize the difficulties the patient is having outside of our office, but also the problems they may be having inside of our office, especially if they're having a negative reaction to us. So we have to be always on alert for a shift in affect on the part of the patient. So we're always looking at the patient's um, facial expressions, her body language, her tone of voice, her choice of words. And if we think that the patient has experienced an intensification of negative emotion, most of the time we'll stop and say, oh, I'm sorry to interrupt. You're looking a little bit more distressed now. What was just going through your mind? It's actually an advantage, usually, if there is a rupture in the alliance with a patient, because it gives you the opportunity to correct the patient's misunderstandings about you, the therapist. And then you can help them generalize what they learned to relationships outside of treatment. So let me give you an example. Um, I had a patient um, who believed that I didn't care about her. And she was able to discover, indeed, that I did care about her, but that she had made an incorrect assumption. Her assumption about me was, if I really cared about her, I would give her 100%. And if I didn't give her 100%, it meant I didn't care about her. So then we discussed what it would look like, if was it even possible that I could give her 100%. For example, it would mean that she could come to my office whenever she wanted. 
if I was seeing a patient, I would have to ask the patient to leave the room so that I could then talk to her. So she was able to see that, no, I was not ever able to give her 100%, but that that didn't mean that I didn't care about her. So that was a very important lesson for her to learn. It was also very important for her to learn that she could have a problem with another person, and that problem could be solved. Uh, after we finished talking about our problem, I asked her, do you ever have this idea about anyone else, someone else who you believe sometimes doesn't care about you because she doesn't give you 100%? And she said, yes. In fact, it happened just this week with her sister. Her sister had invited her over to have breakfast with her children. And my patient said, my sister spent the entire time taking care of her two-year-old child who had a cold instead of paying attention to me. And I said, oh, did you expect your sister to give you 100%? Well, yes, she invited me over to breakfast. Was it possible, given that her child was sick, that she could even come close to giving you 100%? No, I guess not. Is it possible that your sister actually did care about you and does care about you, even though she wasn't able to give you 100%? She said, I, I guess so. I guess that's right. So to make use of a therapeutic rupture, you not only want to heal the rupture, but you want to help the patient generalize specifically from that um, rupture in your relationship to, to take some learning from that and then apply it to specific people outside of the therapy session. I believe that it's really an act of courage for most clients to come to therapy. After all, they haven't met the therapist before. Frequently, uh, they haven't, if they haven't been in therapy before, they have no idea what to expect. They don't know whether the therapist is going to be kind, whether the therapist is going to try to control them, whether the therapist is going to tr try to make them talk about things that they perhaps are uncomfortable talking about. So it's an act of courage to come to treatment. I think it's a good idea to assume that most patients don't feel safe in the therapy session at the very beginning, and then to do everything we can to help them feel safe. When I teach the psychiatric residents at the University of Pennsylvania, the concepts that I get across are the following. First, it's very important for therapists, for their whole careers, to treat every patient at every session the way they would like to be treated if they were a patient. The second thing is, it's very important to be a, just a nice human being in the room with patients. Third, it's very important to have realistic expectations for the patient. I tell my residents, patients are supposed to be difficult. That's why they're patients. It's also important for us therapists to have realistic expectations for ourselves. Um, I'm a much better therapist today than I was five years ago. And I hope I'll be a better therapist five years from now than I am today. So there's always room for improvement and for growth. And if we expect to be able to cure every patient, we are either going to be anxious when we're with our patients for fear that we're going to fail, uh, or we may be irritated with our patients who don't seem to be accepting our help well enough. One way of making most patients, but not all patients, feel more comfortable is through self-disclosure. I have found in general, if the patient doesn't have narcissistic personality disorder, is that patients feel very honored when we share ourselves with them. And I usually make some kind of at least mild self-disclosure at almost every session with almost every client. You know, therapists can have um, dysfunctional beliefs themselves. The most common belief, I think, is I'm incompetent. Um, if therapists have beliefs such as that, they can get activated easily during the therapy session. So it's important that therapists do some CBT on themselves to help themselves respond to these dysfunctional and almost always inaccurate 
um, perceptions about themselves before they enter the therapy session.